Welcome to those of you who made it this evening. I'm Helen Royal. I'm the CEO at Summit Community Care Clinic. We are a federally qualified health center with a mission of serving the underserved, people who experience barriers to accessing care regardless of their ability to pay. We practice with an integrated model. I'm thrilled to have our health educators here doing a presentation this evening. Um, the focus is on nicotine use cessation uh, in our community and um, we are alarmed about the rates of nicotine use in our community and so we're doing everything we can to um, lower that use and help people make good choices for themselves. So with that, I will pass, pass on to Andy. Okay, great. Um, so a huge thank you to Helen and the team at Summit um, Care Clinic and also everyone who's joining this evening and also our friends from the Front Range. Um, we have been working at the University of Colorado Cancer Center in the School of Public Health with Helen and team um, over the last six months to really bolster the work around uh, lung cancer screening, nicotine, uh, usage as well as looking at uh, smoking cessation and the like. And so um, we did have a great partnership with Summit about four or five years ago uh, put a little bit of a pause on that and then again have really re-engaged and so much of our work has really been around chlorophyll cancer screening and navigation. That's part of what we continue but it's noted we're really excited in our uh, cancer screening program and the work that we're doing with Summit to also really help foster the work with uh, cancer prevention, lung cancer screening prevention as well. Um, so huge uh, thank you and then also to the navigators Sam and team who have been really engaged in our work. Um, I'd like to thank Amy Moraski and Elsa, who we'll introduce also as part of our team um, for joining tonight. So we're a small team out of the University of Colorado Cancer Center, but we were awarded um, about $750,000 this last year for preventive screening services and utilizing navigation um, in our work. And so Summit is one, of one community center that we're working with, one FQHC. We work with about 25 other systems as well. So we have over 100 actual clinic sites that we're working doing these sort of uh, technical <coughs> assistance, facilitated support around cancer <coughs> prevention and early detection. Um, so we're really excited because Summit is one of two sites that we're really working towards the integration and implementation of lung cancer screening. Um, and then part of the nicotine uh, usage is something that's been coming up. And I know that there's a lot of community and ballot and, ballot and, policy and uh, potential policy initiatives that are moving throughout the state as well as throughout certain counties that we really also want to support that work. And part of that whole um, initiative, of course, is from a service implementation side, we don't necessarily do policy work at the university and at the Cancer Center and the School of Public Health, but we also are working very collaborative with the State Colorado Cancer Coalition, which I also vice chair. Um, so on your tables, um, there's also a little bit of information about uh, the Colorado Cancer Coalition. They're really starting to grow an active policy uh, forum and discussion, but they also have um, specific uh, targeted supports around chlorophyll cancer screening, uh, breast cancer screening, lung cancer screening are some of the great things. So I'd really engage all of you and really talk a bit about um, what's happening here in the county, but as much as we can uh, support you guys with all of the local initiatives, we're really about coming into the regions and doing more work as opposed to everything being front range. So on behalf of our entire team, um, and again, thanks to Patty, Fernando, and Samita who will be uh, presenting, um, and thanks to Summit and everyone, thanks for all the great partnerships, and we're really excited about this continued um, work through our CCSP program and moving ahead. So thanks. Thank you. I think we can just have people parade by uh, the podium-ish here <laughs> and, uh, and say what your, your name, who you might be affiliated with, and your connection to this issue. Great. I'm Lauren Gilbert. I'm a nurse with Summit County Public Health. and. Um, for the past year and a half, I've been working in tobacco prevention um, through the uh, STEP grant with CDPHE. And so um, we have a, a coalition that's really formed into a pretty robust adult and youth community coalition around tobacco and nicotine use in Summit County. And uh, we've been working pretty hard over the past six months on different um, policies and strategies and ways we can engage with the community to reduce tobacco and nicotine use. Um, so I'll have Bree come up next, and she's um, from our 
Yes um, group. So that's Youth Empowerment Society of Summit, and she's worked with us through um, all these policy strategies and on the coalition with the community. Hi there, um, my name is Brianna Roach, and as Lauren said, I'm a member of the Youth Empowerment Society of Summit, yes. And um, after, throughout my years of high school, I grew accustomed to how prevalent and widespread and casual vaping was within my community. Um, I kind of took this problem to yes, and I started talking to my peers about how I'm constantly having to see it, smell it, uh, reject offers of vape and how several of my friends and like close family members or teammates were suffering with nicotine addictions and talking about this issue made me notice that not some but all of the members of YES had some sort of similar story around vaping and so that's when we joined Lauren's coalition and we started um, just sharing our youth perspective and voice on what advertisement might appeal to us and stuff like that and that's when we got introduced to the local ordinances. Um, and we went to t several town council meetings, I think around 15, 16 town council meetings. And we presented to them about our experiences and um, about how we could solve this or combat this issue by doing things such as increasing the age to purchase nicotine and tobacco products to 21 and requiring vendors of such products to have licenses to sell them and increasing the price with taxation that would then go to further support for cessation education and prevention. Thank you. I'll just go around the table here, that would be great. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Luna and I'm uh, the health navigator in the dental department with SCCC and um, I've been working barely about four or five months that I joined the SCCC team and um, with the job came uh, being affiliated with the STEP grant as well and with the Tobacco Coalition and I really like it especially because um, like Helen said we're trying to have an integrative health care system and I'm hoping to make it easier for um, the dental department to really get our patients to join the tobacco cessation when needed and um, also working with the whole vaping so I'm actually excited to get more information on vaping today so that we can find uh, better ways to really address that as well as a tobacco product and integrate it as well. <coughs> <laughs> All right, uh, hello, I'm Patricia Valverde and I'm a senior instructor in public health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, I've been involved in uh, tobacco for a number of years. I'm a tobacco treatment specialist, so I, I actually coach uh, veterans on smoking cessation <coughs> at the VA. I'm also on the tobacco review committee, so we um, set priorities for tobacco control here in Colorado and fund local public health agencies to support tobacco control efforts as well as interventions. And um, I also work with Sunita and Fernando on a pilot project where we're um, doing focus groups and interviews with Latino youth in Pueblo County and the Metro Denver area all about vaping. Thank you, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, Fernando Alguin, I'm originally from Mexico. I'm, I'm a professor of medicine in the University of Colorado at Anschutz. Um, you know, mostly what we do is we focus on asthma and airway diseases. So clearly we're very interested in, in vaping uh, for a number of reasons. So we're there just absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Hi, my name is Sunita Sharma. I'm an associate professor um, in the Division of Pulmonary Sciences and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Colorado. Thank you to Helen and the organizers for having us here. Um, I think as, a, as ambassadors of pulmonary physicians at the University of Colorado, we're excited to be part of this, you know, this, this program because uh, when we look at outreach to communities, vaping is obviously an incredibly um, important issue and we're happy to be part of this and start building bridges in terms of helping in any way that we can. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here.
Good evening. I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Sam. I'm one of the health navigators here at Summit Community Care Clinic. Um, really, our big emphasis has been on um, community engagement as a whole. And um, thanks to Lauren's efforts, um, Brianna's efforts, um, just kind of identifying the needs of the community um, to just you know meet their patients where they're at um, and to just try to promote their own health goals. And obviously, tobacco <coughs> is one of the most prevalent things uh, within our communities, communities at large. So we're really excited to uh, gain a lot of knowledge from our experts that we're really grateful to have here tonight to kind of pass that on to our other providers as well as community members just to kind of um, bring awareness and attention to not only youth, but to parents, to oh. providers as a whole to just um, kind of have a better understanding as far as, you know, what we're looking at to improve health outcomes. So thank you all for being here this evening. <laughs> Trying to avoid the light. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Amy Moraski. Uh, I am a patient navigation coordinator with the Colorado Cancer Screening Program. Um, so Andy, that's the program she was discussing. Uh, so basically what I focus on is a lot of education and outreach, working with patient navigators such as Sam throughout the state, just to make sure that they really have everything in their toolkit um, to have the best success and to get their patients into those life-saving screens. Um, and for today, what we're really gonna focus on is lung cancer screening, which is kind of a newer thing and um, just giving everyone the, the info and the, the tools that they need to hopefully successfully get their patients and their friends and family into screening. And I'm Elsa Weltzine. Um, I'm also with the CCSP program. <coughs> I'm our health systems evaluation coordinator, so I'm the lead on all the evaluation of how the screening initiatives are going with all of our clinics, um, and then also the sustainability planning aspect. So making sure initiatives that get implemented at these different clinics can be sustainable and continue even after grant funding. So very excited to continue to work with Summit Community Care Clinic throughout the next two years and beyond. Thanks. So Thank you. We're starting now. Okay. Yes, I think our University of Colorado team was first on the agenda. Is that correct? Yeah. Great. Right. Sam is also your um, IT, IT person. IT yeah. Multi-talented. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm an um, uh, instructor in public health, which means I'll kind of set the stage for my clinical colleagues who will talk more about the, the clinical aspects of vaping and, um, and the harms to the body. So I'll, I'll start out by just describing what we're going to cover over the next 40 minutes or so. So we'll be talking about what are vape devices. Uh, it's very easy to not recognize them because they're, uh, they're constantly changing in appearance. We'll also talk about um, some of the differences between what we call combustible uh, tobacco products versus these vape devices. Uh, I'll go through some, uh, some of the recent literature that explains why adults and why youth actually vape. We'll talk about vaping and some of the long-term uh, impact on tobacco use. And then we'll get more into the kind of clinical aspects of this talk and uh, really look at what some of the recent news about the harms of vaping and how it, <coughs> might, how it might impact the respiratory system and the lung functioning. So you're welcome to ask questions as we go along. I'm fine with that. I don't know if for yeah. So go ahead and um, you can stop me if there's a slide that you have a question about. So first of all, let's talk about what when we when we mention vaping, what are we really talking about? There are so many different terms that are used for vaping. It used to be like five years ago we would say e-cigarettes. Now you don't hear the term e-cigarette so much, um, but there's vaping. But even within the vaping world, there are all these different types of devices. And so you might hear about a, it's not an ape mod, it's a vape mod. 
but you might hear about a vape tank, and then you hear about jewels, and now they're becoming verbs. So you're jeweling, or you're. Um, so there's a lot of fluidity in in the terminology that's used for researchers and the Centers for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration. You might hear about electronic nicotine delivery systems, ENDS. But, but basically, people usually just say vaping to mean e-cigarettes and you know, all these other kinds of devices. So I mentioned that it can be difficult to even know what you're looking at because the evolution of these vaping <laughs> devices has changed. We're on, we, there have been different generations of devices. So you'll see here back, uh, what is it, 12 years ago now, the devices actually did look like cigarettes. So the initial e-cigarettes or vapes on the market were, were cigarette look-alikes. But we've gone pretty far away from that now, whereas the Squonk Mods and the Juul, now they're starting to look like technology, like, like a USB or a flash drive. So it has changed considerably over the years. And what we're finding is that school administrators and teachers, unless they're kind of keeping up with the, the different generations of devices, don't necessarily know what it is they're looking at. And especially parents may, know, may not know what that thing is that they find in their kid's room or their friends using, because there are so many different kinds of devices. As I mentioned, I have a project with Fernando and Sunita, and so my research assistant is this 20-year-old that goes to college, CSU Fort Collins. She had vaped before, and uh, so she took me to a vape shop to show me like this huge array of different mm -hmm. kinds of devices. And then the back wall was all filled with what they call e-liquid, all these different kinds of flavorings. It was a whole different world. Um, and I, I work in tobacco, so it, uh, we really have to kind of explore that world and become familiar with what is out there because it is, it's, um, our youth, our young adults are seeing it every day. <laughs> so vaping devices, um, as I mentioned, are different from cigarettes because they are not using a, you know, fire. It's not a combustible device like a cigarette where you light the cigarette and you smoke it. In these devices, there's a battery which heats up a coil or heats up a, um, the part of the device which then creates this aerosol. And the aerosol may, is water but includes other kinds of flavorings and other kinds of chemicals. So, you, so that's why it's not a combustible device. Um, it's, it has a different process than the regular tobacco. Now, you might hear young people or youth say, well, it's just you know, water vapor. That's what's going into the device and that's what's um, coming out of me when I vape. But the truth is, the aerosols has lots of different chemicals in it, and that's what is so worrying about vaping devices. They are not harmless. So this is from a CDC flyer, and it shows that there's nicotine that's, that's being uh, produced from the vape device. There are a variety of organic compounds, and Sunita and Fernando will talk more about it. There's also ultrafine particles that are being breathed in and also um, breathe in through the vape. There are heavy metals, so the, vape, the vape device has metal, heavy metals in it, so portions of it actually get inhaled. And then there are a variety of flavorings with, the, with different chemicals, not, which might be approved for ingesting, but are not approved for inhalation. So there's a lot of different things going in. Um, as well as cancer-causing chemicals. Uh, so Stanford has a prevention program and, and they've created this kind of uh, list of risks of e-cigarette use. Um, so many of the risks I've already talked about, the different chemicals that are being inhaled, 
uh, a major risk that, ver that really concerns us is the use of nicotine. And we know that nicotine is highly addictive. And so that's, um, that's of major concern. So what you often see in the uh, marketing of vape stores and vape devices is that it's less harmful than cigarettes because cigarettes have all these different chemicals, you know, hun over 100 chemicals within the cigarette. And a vape device has only these, you know, four or five um, if it has nicotine at all. And so it gives the appearance that it is harmless, you know, we just have these chemicals compared to cigarettes, so what's the big deal? But as you'll hear later on, Fernando and Sunita will go more into some of these chemicals and their potential impact on your lungs. You know, essentially, our lungs are not meant to inhale <laughs> chemicals. And I was at one seminar with this big uh, tobacco researcher, and he was asked by someone in the, in the room, you know, what about these um, organic oils that, you know, people vape to kind of feel better? And he basically said, they're not meant to be inhaled. <laughs> um, and so it's not uh, appropriate um, to go into your lungs and can damage your lungs. So let's look at Colorado. On your tables, there is an infographic that shows the use of vaping among youth in Colorado. The uh, State Health Department conducts a survey every few years, and so we're able to look at how things are changing in tobacco use among youth. And so what we know is that 33%, so one in three of our youth in Colorado, use nicotine. Now, how do they get the nicotine? Only 7% are smoking, so that's wonderful. Colorado has done an amazing job driving down the cigarette use of our youth. But look at that, 27% use e-cigarettes or vaping. So that's where we're um, now really trying to focus our energy and trying to combat that um, high use rate. Colorado leads the country in vaping among youth. Um, you'll see that as the youth um, get older, you know, go, uh, increase in their grade level at high school, their vape use also increase. So by 12th grade, about 34% use e-cigarettes or vape. Yes? Are these numbers, current numbers, or are they uh, 2017 numbers? 2017, because the survey uh, is probably going into the field this fall or early this spring. Do you have any information at all about what's happened in the last two years? So, um, if anything, it's getting worse. However, with the recent lung disease uh, media coverage, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that might impact our level, the level of e-cigarette use. Um, what we hear anecdotally from young people is that you know, there are pictures of Instagram of kids, you know, throwing away, away their vape device. I don't know if that will show up in the next survey um, because it all depends on when that survey comes out, but that's a very good point. All right, now among adults, uh, here in Colorado, in Summit County, I looked up the rates and Summit County has lower rates of vape use compared to the state. So um, current vape use here in Summit County, you can't really see it, but it is, uh, it's just about um, at the state level. Cigarette smoking is lower, ever cigarette smoking is lower than the state. And then um, ever using a vape device is also slightly lower than the state. So, um, so good work, Summit County. <laughs> Okay, so first let's talk about adults. Why are they saying that they vape or use e-cigarettes? So this was a, a research study that published a couple years ago, and you see um, the rates in 2012 versus 2015. And so in 2012, the majority of the people, of the adults, said that they used e-cigarettes because they wanted to quit smoking. And that actually was the original purpose for e-cigarettes. But then by 2015, that became very much less of a reason, of a motivation to use uh, e-cigarettes. And look at this, social image. 
So the idea that you know famous people are using e-cigarettes or vaping, um, the, it, it looks cool to vape, that became a more important uh, reason among adults in this study. So I'd be curious to hear what you see in your own community, if that resonates with you or if there are other reasons for adults. Any feedback? We, we haven't seen it in Summit County yet, but there is now professional competitive vaping. Oh, mm-hmm. To see yeah. how big a cloud. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's been around for a number of years. Um, yeah, and there are very particular types of uh, devices that you use in order to get the cloud. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're usually young adults that are that are doing that. So for the youth, um, there are a couple of uh, studies nationally that looked at why do youth uh, vape. And uh, in one study, 40%, almost 40% said it was because their family and friends vape around them. So, you know, there's this normalization of vaping. Uh, another 31% said it was because of the flavors. Now, I mentioned that we're doing focus groups, and we've heard some young people talk about the flavors, the names of the flavors. How can you not want to try dragon blood? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> doesn't that sound cool and interesting and fascinating? So the flavors are a huge part of this epidemic. Um, they also said about 17% thought that it was less harmful than cigarettes. Some other reasons were it's easier to get than a cigarette. You know, in high school there are seniors that are 18, so which is why if we increase the age to 21, that will cut off at least one source of getting vaping devices for um, high schoolers. Also, they said it was cheaper. So we hear people, or young people, that say it's like a buck. You know, you could get a device so cheaply at a convenience store, and it's, so it's much cheaper than cigarettes. Um, and 2% uh, said it was because famous people do it, you know? So it looks cool and something that you want to aspire to. Now, another study um, also looked at why young people vape, and about 30% said it was for the experience. So I think you had mentioned that uh, you were tired of people coming to you and asking you if you want to get a hit, if you want to try. Uh, well, we're hearing that as well from the young people in our focus groups, that they're constantly asked if they want to, and you know, so you just try it, right? So it's for the experience, just explore and see what it's like. Uh, about 31% again, um, oh no, some, only 7% said that they vape in order to replace cigarettes. So um, the original intent of these devices really is kind of, you know, a non, a very little uh, motivator. But 63% of the young people in this survey said it was for the taste and entertainment. <coughs> so you know they're bored. What's there to do? You can vape. It's something you could share with your friends. Or the young people would talk about how they would kind of, you know, you can get a hit off it, and then um, it was kind of a social experience. So we've mentioned a number of times that there's this perception that vaping is less harmful than cigarettes. Um, there was a study that asked adults about perceptions of harm, and we are seeing from 2012 to 2017 that there are changes in perception. Now again, all the literature that we're seeing does not take into account the media around the lung injury or the lung diseases. So again, in probably two years, we'll have data that shows hopefully this perception of harm goes up um, and people have a little more realistic idea of what um, these devices can do. So um, NIDA, or the National Institute of Health, um, has a variety of um, flyers and resources for parents and coaches and providers. And so this is one summary of what they're saying about vaping devices. They're saying that um, it can lead to nicotine addiction. And that is the main reason why we're so concerned about vape use among youth, because 
a good proportion of young people who vape would not have otherwise picked up a cigarette. So if they start out just by experimenting and they like the flavors and then get addicted to the nicotine, now we have potentially a whole group of young people that might move into tobacco use or certainly will continue on with uh, nicotine devices. Um, also that there's exposure to chemicals um, and so we'll hear more about that. And we have to really look at the literature and we need more research around how well do these devices help smokers quit smoking. But again, we know that young people are not using vape devices or vaping in order to quit smoking. Our cigarette smoking rates are very, very low. And we know by looking at the data that it's not low because they used a vape device to quit. It's low because they're choosing to vape instead or they're just trying out vaping. Now, um, another major concern that we have about uh, vaping is that, um, again, the original idea of the, of the device of the e-cigarette was to move from cigarette smoking to this electronic device, you know, to vaping, and then off of everything. That was kind of the plan. That's why it was developed. But we're finding out that that is not happening. And in fact, there's a huge portion of people who both smoke cigarettes and use the vaping devices, which is even worse. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's even more harmful. So this study was looking at e-cigarette users or vapors and uh, what they found was that this is the level of people who use, who vape and they also smoke. And there's a much smaller proportion of vapors that were former smokers. And then there's the group that are only vaping so they never smoked. So these are the people that otherwise never would have become addicted to nicotine. We also look, so in, this, in the uh, article they say um, that e-cigarette users were more likely to be younger, they were widowed, divorced or separated, they were alcohol drinkers, and they were exposed to secondhand smoking, they were less likely to be college uh, graduates or to have high incomes. So again, so it's a more vulnerable group um, that are now being exposed to a, a, an addiction, a nicotine addiction. They also looked at it by age group. So again, these are vapors or e-cigarette users by age. So these are current smokers in the blue. So it's our kind of young adults that have, um, that are both vaping and they're smoking at the same time. So the original idea of the device is not, is not uh, how it's being used, which is why in other countries they promote vaping as a way to uh, quit smoking in Europe and England. Here in the US, we're very concerned about vaping because it is not promoting tobacco cessation. So in the fact, in this study, they say dual use increases exposure to nicotine and it may actually perpetuate abuse liability instead of encouraging smoking cessation. Uh, so with that, I hope I gave you some context of why we're so worried <laughs> and why we have this, uh, this summit or this seminar. Um, and now we'll get into more of the clinical aspects of, of vaping. Can you use this? No, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna, so we're gonna really focus on, so Patty has already gone through a lot of issues, so I mean, we're not gonna go, the slides may be a little too medical and technical, so we're just gonna really talk about it and answer your questions and just point out, I think, the most salient aspects of, of the health effects of vaping. You know, through our focus groups that we're doing with Patty and, and Sunita, learn a lot about vaping, you know, you heard terms such as ghosting, 
and finning and all these things. So it's really quite a whole culture around the use of the devices. But so I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, the components. So remember the, the science actually is very impressive. You know, you have a very small reservoir of liquid and it goes through a very heated coil. The heated coil in a, in a, in a cigarette can, can reach temperatures as much as 300 degrees centigrade. And the higher it goes, the higher it generates secondary products that are damaging to the lung. So, and there's some products, I think, I don't know which one there are, maybe Patty knows, but there's some products in which you can control the temperature. And if you make it hotter, then you can have a larger cloud of vaping, believe it or not. So propylene, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin are things that actually the, um, the FDA recognizes as, they call it grass. You know what anybody, it's not marijuana, you know what grass is? Mm -hmm. Grass means for the FDA is when something is generally regarding a safe, generally regarding safe. So these are products that are super safe to use. Guess what? Not into your lungs, right? So they're, they're safe to consume, but or put in your skin, but not in your lungs. So when these things become heated, they generate things like acetaldehyde and formaldehyde. And I don't know if you, if you know formaldehyde is a thing that it's, it's a lot on um, new carpeting and covers, and it's very irritant to the airway in cause cough um, and bronchospasm and asthma. So nicotine, as you know, it's highly addictive. in cause, in cause the airways to contract in high concentrations. The nicotine concentration in an e-cigarette can be several times higher than it can be in a regular cigarette. And then what's really staggering to me is that in 2014, there were 466 e-liquid brands, each with its own website. And since that time, I don't know of any new data, but since that time, there were over 7,000 flavors. Think about that. 7,000 flavors in 400 products, right? Um, Many of them use things that we know are really bad for you, like diacetyl. Does anybody know this, the history behind diacetyl? You know, what, what, what's about it? So it was a chemical that was in popcorn, and popcorn workers were being exposed to it because they worked in the factory and diacetyl was being aerosolized. Yep. So they, they, they found that these popcorn workers were getting really sick with irreversible lung damage. <laughs> They found that the cause was the diacetyl, so it's no longer in the popcorn, I don't think. It is, well, it is, it just don't, they don't, they don't inhale it. Okay. So th these diacetyl compounds are actually what gives us the, the, the uh, sensation of buttery, creamy flavor to food. It's all over the place. You eat it every day, you eat, it's probably on that cream over there, I don't surprised. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very common, right? But you shouldn't be inhaling it. Um, so I can, you know, it's hard to believe that things that were known to be already bad, there were studies that can cause significant lung damage, were already put into e-cigarettes, right? It's like, um, but it's a non-regulated. Uh, so as much as some of the products have been tested in some studies, 70% have found to have diacetyl compounds, right? So it's really quite striking. And I'm just going to give you a shout out because you, you described that better yeah. than a lot of lung doctors. Yes. <laughs> So all these things are present in e-cigarettes. So you can have the slides, right? The slides are, you could, so I won't go into, but you know, all these things like buttery flavor, minty flavors, cherry flavors, cinnamon flavors, um, chocolate flavors. These are all different types of acetyl and aldehydes that are bad for you if you inhale them, right? I can't even imagine what's in dragon blood. <laughs> and certainly there are, you know, there are things that when, when you heat vapor, you form things that are called electrophiles, which are, which are compounds that are very, very small, that are charged. And those things, they're electrically charged, and those things, when they activate receptors in your lung, can cause bronchial constriction, mucus production, cough, sensation of shortness of breath, and a lot of different things. So I just wanted to show you these things in a large core study. What Patty was alluding to is that people that do dual use, actually, which is over here on the right, are more likely to complain of respiratory symptoms. So there's something additive between vaping and tobacco use. People that do both have more respiratory symptoms than, than those that do tobacco alone. This is uh, something that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently about vaping in Colorado. Um, so here's, here you have recent use of, of electronic vapor product, yes or no. This is from the um, Healthy Kids Colorado survey that Patty works a lot with. Um, and what's interesting here is you can see these are a student survey, right? And then the, amount, the prevalence of use by other risk factors, right? So those, for example, that, use, that have used marijuana in the past days, 50% have vaped, 
45 that had sex with more than one partner in three months. So there's a lot of issues that Patty described that are related to, to vaping that are in high risk populations with doing high risk behavior things. Now we're going to talk a little bit about, stop me if I'm moving too fast, I just want to, I know Patty already went through a lot of these things. So as you know in the news, very recently um, we started seeing a lot of sick cases. And I think the count is like up to 44 deaths, more, 70. The number keeps keeps increasing because it, the reason why the numbers are increasing is because now there's actually they're coming up with case definitions, right? So there's probable cause, and there's actually confirmed causes, um, and so people are becoming much more aware that this is happening. Whereas before they may probably be labeled with other diagnoses. So there was a there was I'm going to talk to you, Sumira, so pitch in what you want to. I'm going to talk talk about two studies that have shown one published in the journal Medicine where they described. 50 plus cases in Wisconsin and Illinois, is that right? Um, and how these, ki how these kids and adults presented to the, to the hospital. So these are cases, these are people that had vaped within the nine, 30 days, I think it was, and who presented with respiratory symptoms and infiltrates on the x-ray that other things were excluded. So um, the CDC sends out almost daily notices yeah. and today's it said, as of yesterday, there were 1,604 confirmed and probable lung injury cases, and then there were 34 deaths in 24, 24. states. Not in, not in Colorado. Not in Colorado. So I just want to put on here that this is a young population, 19 years of age. Uh, some of them have asthma and anxiety disorders. Many of them report also nicotine use and THC use as much as 80%. So there's a lot of perks. There's nicotine alone, there's CBD oils, and there's both. Um, but what's interesting here is, here's, here's some of the symptoms. If you look at here, this is a percentage over here. People presented with shortness of breath, cough, coughing blood, nausea, vomiting, so a lot of intestinal symptoms, and a lot of fever. So the case definition that the, that the CDC is using, people that present with acute respiratory distress or shortness of breath, diarrhea, fever, and the thing is, as Sunita and I know, this looks like a lot of things in medicine, right? A lot of different things. So the fact that somebody presents with that doesn't necessarily mean that there, there's, no, let's call it, what's, val, val, what's the name now? Val, val, vaping, vaping related. Electronic vaping associated lung injury, Valley. Right? Did I get it right? Um, it's kind of sticky. Um, so I'm going to move through this, but. Um, Anyway, I'm gonna, and I can tell you a little bit about the patient experience. Although there haven't been no reported deaths in the state of Colorado, we have a significant amount of experience with this disease, this vaping and this lung injury um, in patients in Colorado. And I'm going to give you just a case of one we've recently seen in the University of Colorado. As you've already heard today, this is a gentleman, young guy, 22 year old, with a history of a combination of both cigarette use and e-cigarette use. So he was actually admitted to an outside hospital um, with shortness of breath, um, low oxygen levels, fever, and then chest pain. And he was found initially on his initial chest x-ray to have a collapsed lung. And when he came to us, he had a combination of fever, shortness of breath, and a significant amount of oxygen requirement. And his smoking history, as you can see here, he smoked up a pack a day of cigarettes. And this was for a number of years. It was about six years of, of smoking history. And then he also vaped about six milligrams of nicotine at the nicotine cartridge three times a day. Yep. Just related to that, how did, how was that estimated that it was six milligrams? Was it because he used like a prepackaged pre -pre 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 cartridge? Okay. Yeah, and so that was based on the nicotine count level in that particular cartridge. I just have one question. So oh, was he using three, going through three cartridges per day? Yes. Okay. So a significant amount of use. Wow. And, and that's in addition to smoking an additional one packet of cigarettes a day. So quite a bit of time consumed smoking. <laughs> and so no, we, we ask, uh, on one of the focus groups, we asked one of the kids, what was the thing that, that really concerns you the most? And she said, seeing their friends withdraw. Because when they're withdrawing, they cannot think of anything. But well, you probably see this a lot, right? Yeah. And I think this, these images um, actually kind of give you a nice example of what happens when people develop lung injury related to vaping. And I am going to make this relatively simplistic, but 
I'm a, I'm a lung doctor, and so one of the reasons I love lungs is because you have two sides to compare. So you can see some normal areas and then some areas that are completely involved. And so just to give you a little bit of a sense of what we see that is abnormal here, First of all, you can see some areas of normal lung, which you can see here, which are kind of the black areas, which are areas that are doing their job, which is helping bring in oxygen. But these regions of the lung that are white, we call these infiltrates, that white area is injury to the lung. It's a combination of inflammation um, and fluid buildup that can, has resulted in injury to the lung. So what happens when somebody develops this, this level of injury is the lung's ability to do its job, which is very simplistically stated as bringing in oxygen, becomes compromised. So you, as you saw in the New England Journal article, a lot of these people require supplemental oxygen, and many, including those who've passed, required mechanical ventilation. That means being on a breathing machine related to the lung disease. And what's also noticeable in this particular example is he also had, as I said, came in with some, some chest pain and had a collapsed lung. And what happened was that there was injury to the gas exchange parts of the lung. And so he also has air in places that you shouldn't see air. And that's here, that's in the subcutaneous, in the tissue, but also in the areas of the mediastinum, so which is where the heart, for example, sits. And so when you see injury to the lung to this degree, this is an exceptionally concerning. And so luckily, uh, with a combination of time and cessation from vaping and tobacco products, um, he did slowly get better. And he was also treated with an anti-inflammatory anti medication called prednisone that helped him get better overall. He's gonna come back to our clinic to get some additional lung function testing, but the long-term support of this is also really concerning and something that we don't know what the long-term impacts of this are gonna be and it's where there needs to be some additional investigation. Just out of curiosity, what is his profession? Is he working? Uh, he was an Uber driver. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh. <coughs> I was wondering how much smoking you could get in with what job that Yeah. <laughs> some of the people that I've seen in my clinic, the worst are people that actually work in the in dispensaries. Dispensaries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The CDC has put up a website. I just took some experts for that. Um, about the pub, for the public and for clinicians. So this is um, from the CDC. They want to um, look at people, you know, with respiratory symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, and non-specific symptoms. Uh, this is what they're seeing that we showed you. Um, the CDC is doing a lot of measurements, and so if you have a patient that you suspect vape-related lung injury. Um, you can send samples to the CDC. The CDC is actually taking these samples and doing in-depth analysis to look at what compounds. Because the reason, the reality is, is that we don't know exactly what the culprit is. Maybe there's more than one thing, right? But there's a lot of epidemiological clinical data, but there's not specific toxicological data. Uh, so they're looking at a lot of uh, pathological specimens. Um, they're looking at the e-liquids. Uh, they're sampling a variety of things. So I think we're going to be learning a lot more from the Center for Disease Control. So the CDC recommends um, not to use, I mean, if people, for people that vape, not to use any kind of like unofficial, illiquid, pop, pop and mom shop with some oils, right? Uh, but definitely that no one should use any type of vaping device of any kind because it's unsafe. Now, we in clinic, for example, get asked a lot, people come in with smoking problems and they're like, I want to quit you, I vape. You know, there's, there's actual data, there's actually well done studies um, that vaping can help somebody lead to, now how do you know, I don't even know how to call it anymore, organic tobacco cessation, uh, or combustible smoke. So, but the problem is it, it's, it's used in, in a variety of uses for which it was not originally intended, right? So as a pulmonologist, one is wondering what is worst, cigarette smoking or vaping? And so I always tell patients, there are only two things you put in your lungs, air and medication, right? <laughs> and oxygen if you need a lot of But I think some people, I've seen some people go through, from tobacco to vaping, feeling better and eventually quitting. So I think under supervision um, and group support, and you know, not just like willy-nilly, can, we can have some positive effects. But the problem is that there's no safeguards, right? It's all over the place. It's used in completely wrong way. Um, and, and there are other great cessation products available that work well. Right, right. Um, I think the study in the Indian Journal of Medicine was tested against nicotine patch and mm -hmm. behavioral support, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
one other thing is um, the companies that create these devices are uh, being required by the FDA to submit plans and evidence that it can be used for cessation because many of them, like Juul, now have, uh, they've had marketing messages around use this to quit, but they haven't supplied the evidence. So all of that will be going through the FDA uh, and we'll, we'll kind of see what, what happens. So just remember that if you suspect a case, there's actually a website that you can uh, talk to somebody. There's, there's a, you know, the, I used to work for the CDC uh, for eight years, and the CDC has a, a command center that's very impressive. It looks like they could launch the uh, Apollo 11 there. It's full of screens. They can talk to any government in the world. I mean, it's very impressive. And they have 100 people manning the phones. Uh, and so it's, it's, that's when the CDC goes into a public crisis mode. So they have set lines where you can say, like, I suspect of a case, and they'll tell you what to do, how to send the samples, how to do everything, okay? So this is from the Utah, I'm not gonna go, just, I wanna highlight a couple of things. Uh, this is from the uh, Utah Youth Experience, but I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, vitamin E was detected 90% of THC products. This is striking because people be like, hey, you're vaping vitamin E, vitamin, is good. vitamin E is good for you, man. It's like, when you ingest it, not when you vape it. Right, because vitamin E actually can have very significant proxidant effects, so uh, can lead to lipopneumonia, which is lipid accumulation in the airspace that the lung cannot get rid of. Um, so this is another thing I found striking. Average use for ETHC five puffs a day, which is over here, and average use for E nicotine twenty five puffs a day. So quite striking. Um, just to show you that this is the percentage of people that require mechanical ventilation, high number of people and a long duration stays on time. So, I mean, it's quite serious. Um, is your yeah, and I think the, the, the question always now is, you know, what happens in terms of the chronic effects of it, um, e-cigarette exposure or vape exposure? And the honest answer is we don't know for sure. And this is where, I, I mean, I sound a little bit like a broken record, but this is where additional investigation is essential. I think, you know, when we look at what happened in terms of our understanding of what, what's happened with tobacco and the health impacts of tobacco, it took a long time for us to understand, and some of that is because the data was hidden. The quite honest answer is we're concerned about the health impacts chronically, and not just in terms of what's happening with the lung, but what it happens with other organs as well. But we need additional information to know exactly what those health, health impacts are. What we, ha what we do know based on epidemiologic data is that it's associated with shortness of breath, and this kind of what we describe as chronic bronchitis, which is chronic cough and a bunch of sputum production. Um, and then it's also associated with, the, with asthma, the development of asthma, as well as wheeze. And interestingly, there's a lot of new emerging data looking at when people vape, uh, use e-cigarette um, products, that those, they also are associated with increased respiratory infections. So we're coming on the flu season, bad flu season uh, last year and many of the years past. So individuals who vape have been associated, it's been associated with increased upper respiratory tract infections and susceptibility to things like the flu. So that health impacts are great. And as we've already talked about a little bit today, it's not just the lungs, it's the nose and the nasal mucosa, it's the eyes and a variety of other organs. But I think when we look at kind of the long-term impacts on the lung, it's been associated with poor lung function, so the lung's ability to do its job becomes compromised over time. It's associated with increased airflow obstruction, so that's when the airways narrow and your ability to get air out of the lungs becomes compromised. And it, as, I, as I said, it, it changes the, the body's immune system in the lung and changes the lung's ability to handle infection. And then, uh, I, I, um, so the other, the other kind of chronic impacts of the disease are of, of, of e-cigarette exposure are really kind of where, where we need to focus in the future. What we worry about is cardiovascular impacts, things like um, heart attacks, for example, where nicotine and tobacco products have already been shown to be associated with cardiovascular disease. There are some really great data looking at how it impairs neurologic function, so brain function in adolescents, which is particularly concerning. And then um, the, the association with cancer is the big concern. And this is data for tobacco um, and to tobacco-related cigarette products, but this is of concern for individuals who use these products. So we, we, will, we hope to study this and get a little bit more understanding of 
what the long or the long term impacts of these are. But this is of particular concern. We're going to stop there. I know that's a lot. So questions? yeah, I just have a comment because we've been watching all of these cases come forward, and there was one that was a youth. I can't remember which state, but she had been sick for a really long time, and providers were just asking, did she smoke? Did she use tobacco products? Well, this isn't smoking and it's not a tobacco product and it wasn't until they actually started asking about vaping that she said, oh yeah, I vape every day. And so I guess, you know, if, with public health, we, we're doing all our health alerts and sending, you know, all the, the latest and greatest recommendations and guidelines to our healthcare providers, but we still haven't had any reports from anybody back. And I know that in this day and age with electronic health records, you know, it's the questions that are asked are already built into these larger systems, and, and none of them are asking about e-cigarette. It's tobacco products. It's smoking. And so, um, you know, until some of those system, bigger system changes happen with Aprima and all of these other, other systems, sometimes pro providers aren't going to be, you know, cued in to ask yeah. about it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, especially youth don't view it as smoking. So, you know, we, Quitline is a wonderful resource and um, offers quit, uh, cessation services for youth, but they have to know to go there even though they're not smoking cigarettes. So, yeah, it's a, we, it, it is very challenging. And, I, you know, I think we, we hope that with some of the media coverage of the current lung injury cases that people are asking with more frequency, but my guess is exactly what you say, is that the question is still under-asked in larger population. And most of the cases that are being, are being investigated are mainly hospitalizations, mm -hmm. and so the people are, is it something new, and they've been treating lung illness with corticosteroids, which is what you're using as treatment. So it's, you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg of what we're actually seeing. Yeah, right. And the more subtle cases are not being reported and we're treating it as a slightly different disease. That's a, it's a great point. Uh, doctor, um, doctors, <laughs> you're all doctors. Um, why do you think we have seen these acute uh, and sometimes fatal lung injuries in this country? And perhaps, as Amy points out, We've only looked at the most obvious and most recent ones. But other countries have not had this experience. Uh, the UK, for example, where uh, I've read that even hospitals will have vape shops in the hospital to help people stop smoking. What, what, what's your reflection on that? So we, this would be a little bit of a guess, but my guess, my guess is that it is also under-recognized. So even places like China, for example, where e-cigarette use is substantial. My guess is, so again, when you look at the pattern, and I'm going to just kind of reference what Fernando said earlier, the lung injury pattern looks like a lot of what we see related to other diseases. So we can see the same exact kind of picture for uh, uh, what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome related to infection. And so my guess is some of these are getting treated as a slightly different illness, but may be related to the same disease. And so it's maybe under-recognized you know, is my assumption. Another thing that may be interesting in the parallels epidemic curve is the addition of new flavors. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if the UK has the same issue with flavors, but in this country has been an explosion of flavors in the last five years. 15,000. Yeah. So it could be that we're actually, these countries having a lot more chemicals than other countries at a very fast rate. Um, and, and, and the other question is, is some of this related to dual use, both the combination of vaping and tobacco use, which is quite frequent in this country. I don't know that I know what the specific combinations are there. But it's, I'm going to guess it's a, a little bit of all of these things. How about access to THC? Where this is becoming like yeah. You never want to put oils in your lungs. <laughs> well, the question I was wondering. Any kind of oils in the lungs yeah. manage very well. Ever. Right. In the states that are having higher numbers, I don't know if medicinal marijuana has been approved or even recreational, but if they're seeing higher rates in the states that have, have those. 
Well, in I Utah, haven't. for example, the, the MMW I was in Utah, Utah, I think it's illegal. Mm -hmm. And you know, they still sort of on case. Yeah. There, there is, there's, they're probably coming from Colorado. <laughs> 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 well, that's why. I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> that's why there's a wall being built. Back to your Sharma. Um, I, I missed that last slide of yours that had the pictures on it. Um, tobacco typically has been um, uh, recognized as paralyzing basically the cilia in the tracheobronchial tree, and that's part of the reason why respiratory illness being. It, is that true also? Of That's a great question. So according to animal models, that appears to also be the case. And part of that, in addition to compromising the cilia, there's changes that in the kind of immune system of the airway, which is the combination of ciliary dysfunction. So those, those cilia, they help us move all of the mucus, that stuff that we don't like to cough up, but that stuff out of the lung. When those don't function well, and then you add to that the combination of the immune system not working well in the airway, it's what leads to an increase in respiratory infection rates in these individuals, and at least that combination together. Can I ask one quick question also about the regulatory side? So we were talking about like the sales and the consumption and how right now, I mean, there's the different ones that like in terms of Juul and whoever having this specific thing where they have to either talk about like what's included or do these sort of advertisements and the like. What other, I mean, what regulatory group is actually looking at these inclusion of different chemicals or flavors? Is there anyone really regulating that or where does that? So the, the, the FDA has been highly criticized because they've been, they've been incredibly slow to respond. Because they, until now they've been completely unregulated, but I think the pressure is on. Mm -hmm. So we'll see more than that. Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah, people. I mean, there's, 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 or there's states like California where they want to run it all together. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see what happens. We have, um, we are now in the process of um, entertaining a question on the member ballot. Ballots have already been distributed, so we hope people are voting. But um, this will increase the price through a tax of four dollars a pack on cigarettes and forty percent of the purchase price on vaping and other products. Um, do you know how effective this is in curtailing uh, the use of nicotine tobacco products in, in youth? It is. I mean, there's probably just as a show that pricing, point pricing is one of the things that curtails people's behavior. And I think you mentioned it. I mean, I think, yeah, it's been clearly really shown that if you increase the price, you know, some people reach a point where they say, okay, I can't be spending this kind of money on what so. Um, it's actually the best. The best. The best, yeah, it's policy. A yeah, it's a policy level uh, intervention. It's the best because youth are price sensitive. Um, and other <laughs> special nice groups. Way of calling us. Yes. Or, or, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, <laughs> be very <laughs> Yeah, so it's, uh, it really is the best way. Um, yeah, I think you can find devices that are 99 cents, and, mm -hmm. and then the liquids, or you could get, some packets are, are more expensive, but, uh, but definitely trying to increase the price and increase the <coughs> age is another, um, another policy measure that different cities and different states are looking at. That's, you know, as I mentioned, you know, in high school, because seniors are often 18, they can just, you hear a lot from youth that it's through their friends and their older friends that they have access to everything. And so the more we, we limit their, or make it a little more difficult, the um, less it'll be more difficult for them to use. In other countries, they use packaging as part of the smoking session. I don't know how it works very well, just in Mexico. And I was stunned to see some of the, because yeah. they sell cigarettes everywhere and so you look at some of the packages and they're like a, a dead fetus, a uh -huh. black food, I mean a guy with an open chest with a yeah. cancer, I mean, it's just like horrendous pictures. Yeah. Uh, people are just like ignoring them because there's, <laughs> the same perception happens predominantly in adolescence is like it's not going to happen to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I would say one of the most interesting things that I feel that has come out of some of our focus groups amongst the adolescents who they 
Is, is there, you know, when you ask them specifically, how would you, you know, what would you propose to try and get people, you know, you to stop vaping, all of them point to increasing the cost as probably the, the best measure and then decreasing the flavor and options. You know, it's pretty clear when you have a, a, a flavor like dragon blood, it is. I mean, this is a small company, so this is for adults. And then this is targeted marketing. Yeah, it's flavors like what, sugar, pop, and mint, mango. Yeah, but it's also in cigars. I mean, it's in every product. Yes. Yeah, that's why all products need to be included right. in these policies because um, pineapple cigars are. Really are you cheap passing cheap. that sample? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just our personal stash. <laughs> I am conscious of our time, and I want to make sure all our presenters have time. So, great discussion. And we should have some time at the end as well, but like I said, I just want to honor other other sets. And I thought it was great timing to have um, our navigators come in because they're the ones that can intervene. You know, when you're asking the questions about, are people asking about vaping? You know, is it in our, our EMR? Those type of things. Um, we, we can get people before they get sick, right? And, and intervene before those symptoms start showing up, right? So with that, Superwoman, Superman, <laughs> take it away. Yeah, so Elizabeth and I are gonna to speak to some of the screening and cessation services that are offered specifically to the care clinic themselves. Um, so within these um, metrics, um, these are based off at least two primary care visits within the last 24 months. So that does miss out on people that we have who are coming in, whether they are vacationing, whether they don't access the clinic regularly, um, since we have a pretty wide population that comes from a pretty um, mixed area around the county. So um, up to date of the last year, 95% um, of our patients have been screened, but that screener is limited to, do you use tobacco? And we all just kind of spoke to that piece as far as kind of limiting that language um, for all of us we may recognize tobacco comes in a lot of forms but for our patients trying to uh, improve that lay language to uh, work in you know do you vape do you smoke do you chew uh, and i think that's going to be one of our big emphasis in our prima our electronic health record is to clarify that language regarding um, nicotine use of any variety uh, so currently what we're seeing um, Within the clinic themselves, 9.5% uh, of our patients are currently reporting active tobacco use at that time of the visit. But within that 24 months, obviously, there's a pretty significant gap there in terms of how accurate that current use status is. Um, and so overall, since 2016, uh, 11, just over 11% reported current uh, nicotine use of some, or tobacco use of some variety. Um, so has shown a reduction. We've also seen an increase in engagement over the past year, um, close to double as far as people engaging in cessation services. But that could be, you know, a conversation with their provider. It could be a referral to the Colorado Quit Line. It could be meeting with a health educator to kind of have some ongoing support, being referred to a behavioral health provider. Um, so there is some question marks as far as uh, improving our tracking to see, you know, not only engagement, but, you know, how long and how successful they are with their cessation efforts as well. Uh, so yeah, up, up for, uh, you know, slightly up to 58% over the past six months, which we're happy for. That's part of our engagement. We're also trying to work on more um, lung cancer screenings as well. And then regarding our adolescents, that's one of our biggest gaps that we see in the clinic. We do have uh, school-based health centers, um, and so we see students right in the school, which is a great opportunity to be able to have you know, reduced barriers to care. Um, however, screening regarding adolescents is... Um, needs improvement and there's a lot of question marks there uh, but we are starting to um, address that and that's where some of our goals are improving tracking improving that kind of questions just to make it clear um, that that's an emphasis for us and for our patients um, so as far as um, being an integrated care facility that's really where it comes down to collaboration of, of all of our team members whether it be providers whether it be clinic assistants who are checking in every patient having that rapport asking them those questions and try to reframe that language to make it more friendly to our patients to, to kind of you know feel comfortable about talking about it because that's one of the biggest things is um, resistance to even wanting to say 
do you smoke? Do you do these types of things? And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just kind of wave it off. So really just trying to focus in on, it's more of a conversation where it stands rather than pointing the finger, cracking the whip, or trying to just, you know, see where your behaviors are currently. Um, and there is some variance between our medical facility as well as our dental facility. So our medical does have the ability to be tracked using Azara metrics, which is where the bulk of those um, previous statistics were. Uh, but you want to, would you like to speak to a little bit as far as the variance to the dental? Mm -hmm. So for us, we actually are able to, we don't have to ask the patients right away. We actually have an intake form where they say, uh, yes, currently using tobacco or no. And then they're able to say yes it's tobacco or not but then they also have that option to not uh, fill that intake sheet as well so if they do smoke tobacco right away i'm called in and i can ask the question or they sometimes will ask the question the dental assistants and um, they will say you know i'm not interested so they don't bring me in uh, those are the bad ones because then we're kind of losing track on that but at the same time um, unlike a prima <laughs> in dentrix we still have to get some codes for uh, being able to figure out um, how many people were able to visit, how many people were able to follow up with uh, the referrals, and I would say more the number of people that are smoking is more uh, addressed in Dentrix. So we're working on that, and hopefully by January 2020, because we're getting an um, upgrade for their software, and we're excited because there's going to be a lot of changes, and hopefully we can get those codes to mirror up Prima as well. And Pretty much the rest, we do the same. Um, we follow up, we try to ask them, and depending on the person and what they want to do, meet them at their level and uh, proceed from there. And um, one of the things that I've noticed myself is that we do have a lot of patients that just visit our dental clinic and they you know, okay. rave about it and they're really satisfied with their care, but we'll see when we go in, they do finally have a medical visit. <laughs> their chart is completely full of dental visits and, and hopefully it's being addressed, which, you know, yeah, which it sounds like it is, but the variance of people only seeking dental care is surprising versus medical care. So there's not always as, as much crossover as I would have anticipated. Um, and then within the medical side of things, generally that'll be initiated during their check-in. So they'll be visiting with a clinic assistant um, and it'll be screened. So it's just that simple question. So if they um, decide to not answer it or they decide to um, incorrectly answer it, sometimes that'll get missed. So I think that's where improving that language will go. Um, if they do uh, admit to being currently using, um, that's something that Jen is generated either to the provider or to a health navigator. And then that discussion kind of splits from there, whether they are ready to engage in you know, cessation discussion or actually starting some sort of tailored cessation program for them, which is um, our big emphasis of moving into um, the, the care team model as far as working where they're at, working through those stages of change with that patient to see, you know, have they had any quit attempts in the past, some of their strengths or some of their successes um, or some of their failures, some of their behaviors, some of their environmental concerns as well, just to kind of meet them where they're at so we're not just saying, are you smoking? You should stop. Not having that kind of um, repetitive conversation that unfortunately goes on. Um, and then one portion that Lizzie mentioned as well is kind of re-engaging every, every time, or not even every time, but at least you know, with some frequency every one to six months uh, after they have a dental or a medical visit to just see where their status is or to see if they are ready for cessation services. Uh, and if they're not ready, just trying to shift their focus to other health goals. If they're not ready to talk about smoking or vaping, you know, what are some other things to hopefully encourage promotion of those healthy behaviors is, is a secondary action that we try to follow up with a lot of those patients. Um, and then specific to, uh, we had touched about that with Patty a little bit, but um, if they are interested, you know, we have a host of referrals, whether that be to the quit line, in the clinic, if they are a Medicaid patient, um, they do have that benefit to them to have you know, additional counseling, whether it be from a licensed provider, from a health navigator. We can refer them to a behavioral um, clinician if they have more concerns around you know, anxiety, depression, and that maybe is you know, some of the influence as far as why they are vaping or smoking or chewing. 
um, and then also um, some opportunities for our prenatal patients as well. Getting engaged with some additional kind of case management is another um, great service that Medicaid is going to cover. And then the NRT products and Chantix, uh, which is um, a nice option, especially considering where we live, the cost of medications in general, we're all aware of how high they can be. So really just trying to kill a lot of those barriers to give people the tools that they are ready to accept. Um, and I'm going to butt in for just a second. Yeah. It's wonderful that Medicaid has that benefit and Medicare will pay for some as well. Um, our focus is not on what their payer is. It's engaging people. And again, you said it perfectly, knocking down the barriers. So it's really nice when we get paid for doing that. We appreciate that. But it doesn't change how we work with populations. Yeah, yeah and some of yeah. our patients that are um, um, full fee or they are care card, we do have in-house Chantix available, sometimes depending on our supply. So um, you know, if they're really ready to engage, that is a, another option that we're trying to work with. Other medications as well, but specifically Chantix. Okay, and then um, we have like uh, our external uh, cessation programs. Uh, one of them I actually work really close to, which is the quit line that you mentioned as well. Um, working with, uh, I'm the lead for the step grant, so I get to work a lot with this. Um, they really want to try to push it and um, get a lot of people to join it. So pretty much they offer a lot of coaching sessions. Uh, you will probably, if you join, you will usually get a lot of different um, coaches. And then they're um, able to give you NRT products um, as well. Um, the naturopath, um, that one gives you alternative herbal medication. And I Not to be inhaled, but to <laughs> be <laughs> Just to clarify. He said only, what was it? Medication, <laughs> oxygen, yeah, and then, yeah. <laughs> We got that one. Um, and then, um, it has to do also with the patient-specific spiritual considerations. Um, and then there's private practice, which is psychologists, and those are just some um, behavioral counselors that are outside of our facilities as well. So they do the same, which have behavioral, work with the behavioral. Um, sorry, I'm losing my words. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Uh, with their behavior and just um, try to figure out what it is that they could do um, within themselves to cause that change and provide results. And then lung cancer screenings, why? Um, you were addressing it. Mm -hmm. uh, more patients of lung cancer in the US um, than breast, prostate, and colon cancer combined are happening. Um, and what it is, a non-invasive low-dose compute tel tomograph um, scan of the chest. And um, for to be eligible, you have to be uh, 55 to 77 years old, um, a current smoker, or have quit in the past, uh, in the last 15 years, uh, tobacco history of at least 30 pack years, pack, yeah, 30 years. And forgive me, you guys, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> and, um, You're doing great. Thank you. And asymptomatic, which is no signs of lung cancer and healthy enough to undergo treatment. Um, the procedure costs, they're covered, forgive me. <laughs> so this is the, the new program that we're initiating. So it, it is new, as it is. We haven't given all the details. <laughs> um, yeah, but I guess this is what we're excited to be able to, to offer a partner. I mean, who, do, who does your readings and follow-ups? Because, you know, even in people that are super high risk like that, the majority of the things that you find are not malignant. Mm -hmm. And so it requires a lot of like, careful evaluation in a module experience center. I'm not making a pitch to our module. Right. <laughs> <laughs> are you asking to say volunteer? So, so they, I mean, it's, it's, compli it's a complicated process. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Actually, I don't know, Andy, if you know the... Yeah, so um, I think that with um, the physicians who had been working at Summit, they initiated a lung cancer screening uh, program several years ago with the same funding we have currently at St. Amy's. Um, and then so we're making those connections right now. National Jewish Health is part of our implementation team, but part of it is really, um, you know, Helen and team's decision about who they're going to work with for the implementation side of this work. Um, so we're working, I mean, we're working on the first step of 
looking at the readiness, um, going through the workflows, a de dedicated uh, component, and GH has been part of it, uh, but we'll be also looking at the clinic systems and where they're working, who are the, I and mean, then we'll talk a little bit about who is on the registry, who are people who are certified groups, so that that way um, we are looking at um, those downstream effects and looking at nodule review and the like, but going through the, and so that's part of what we're providing through CCSP is that technical assistance, that it's not just about sending any random person who has a CT machine, sure, it's really sure. about. So that's part of what we're really working through right now, and um, our program will be able to provide technical assistance, professional development, um, workflow development, making these connections with the right type of uh, different types of radiology, pulmonology teams, we're willing to accept the, the patients. But I think what we're trying to also do in this part is also make sure that we look at what can be done within primary care to make sure who's eligible, patient navigation, removal of barriers, and then also that it can be part of the continuity of care. I think there's some really great boutique programs that are centered within sites, but if we're really gonna make this part of public health practice, and more of a routine component, we have to start integrating more of this work within primary care, and that's what the grant's supposed to be doing. And part of the reason we've brought you here today is to bring you into our evil web. Okay, good. <laughs> so just so we're all clear. Okay, good. So, um, and then, yeah, I think the CCSP section is next. I should mention we have different champions in our clinic of different initiatives, and so um, that helps our navigators or clinic assistants, it, it depends on what we're working on, uh, really hold the torch, and so compliments to these two for doing that in their areas. It's awesome to see the dental health in your, and looking at that overlap and integration really impressive. Sam, do you know um, when the questions are asked at the clinic in both medical and dental side, um, do they ask not just about tobacco use, but also specifically about treatment? It's not built into the templates that are in a Prima. It is something that we have identified that needs to be changed, and there's some other things with that Prima as a whole that we're wanting to change some of that language, but currently, yeah, it's just do you use tobacco? But even if it's not in a prima, the providers and staff are asking that question even if it's not in a prima? Or do you know? It's a, it's a variance. I mean, a lot of times we do have a good amount of rapport with our patients, so you know, sometimes it's already known. Um, we're taking uh, some nonverbal cues if we just happen to have some of that scent. Uh, but there's a lot of resistance within our patient population to talk about it at times. So. Sure. It's really mixed between each, you know, care team. Um, yeah, I couldn't speak to each provider, kind of how they speak to their right, patients. Right. And that's where we, I hope anyway, we can get some support in languaging, messaging, yeah. how you can get to that place, um, yeah. whether it's navigators or providers or who it is, to have those conversations beyond tobacco and, and into vaping. Mm -hmm. I mean, and. We'll, we'll go in there. We're going there. We're yeah. just not there. Yeah. Okay. Hey. hey. <laughs> I had this whole intro, like this whole segue planned, and then we just started the conversation a minute ago anyway. So I'm just going to go with it. Um, so, yeah, basically, I'm just going to go over exactly what um, they were discussing with the lung cancer screening and just give a little bit more detail and a little bit more context around uh, some of the things that we're looking at for a screening program and just what it means to screen. So firstly, what is it? Um, so as she mentioned, it is using a low dose CT scan. So I just really want to emphasize that fact that it is low dose. So it's not going to be the same as your diagnostic scan. Um, and of course, any less radiation you can be exposed to is better. So I just really want to make sure that that is emphasized. Uh, so it is non-invasive with CT scan, just like that picture. You go in the donut, you hold your breath for 10 seconds, you come out, bam. So it is uh, hopefully going to minimize some of those barriers when we have a screen like, say, colonoscopy, where there is a lot of prep and there's a lot involved. Um, this is 
in essence, much simpler in regards to the actual screen itself. So hopefully, it will be a little bit easier for patients to undergo this routine. So the screen itself, we're looking for what's called nodules. Um, and so those lumps, those growths, um, are what really are going to be indicative of potential cancer. Um, not all nodules are cancerous. Human bodies are weird and gross and they grow things. <laughs> that's just normal and that's okay. Um, but there is a very specific format that is followed to, to look at those nodules and see what size is it, what does it look like, and, and really identify could this be cancer, could this be dangerous, do we need to do follow-up scans and move on, or is it just your body doing your body's thing and um, do we just need to kind of keep an eye on it and, and go forward. So that's what the screen is really looking for and what you really want to pick up on. And it is annual. So it's not just a one and done, it is once a year, every year. Eligibility, so the ages 55 to 77, that's what you're typically gonna see in most places because that's really what you're looking at for insurance purposes. Um, Medicaid, Medicare, um, private insurance, you will see sometimes a little bit of wiggle room, um, usually going up to say 80 instead of that 77. Uh, but for just basic consideration, that's the age group we want to look at. So current smoker, quit in the last 15 years, like we said, uh, which is good because it does really extend that umbrella out a little bit. We can capture more people um, and not just to say if someone's quit five years ago, 10 years ago, they still have the opportunity to engage in this in the screening program. Is that, so the, is that also current vapor? Like if they're just vaping and not smoking? Or is this specifically just combustible? Yeah, that is my next point. A 30 pack year history. And right now, a screening program is only focused on cigarettes. Um, and that is, you know, for several reasons. One, vaping is new. Yeah. And so the consequences. Um, we're looking at people that have a lifetime usage, and so the long-term consequence of vaping, we don't really have that to put into this model yet. Um, the other side of it is, frankly, this is based off of the study on lung cancer screening. So we only have the data from that study, and those are the models we have to follow. I do expect that over time, as we learn more, as we see more studies, some of these components are probably going to change. We're going to see some fluidity in here, but for now, for today, um, it is focused on specifically cigarette usage. Um, but keep in mind that is any kind. Shorts, longs, menthol, regular, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's just that pack year. Um, and I am going to explain that in just a second of what that actually means. And then basically you want to have not to say a clean bill of health, um, but you don't want the symptomology of cancer. And really with that, we're talking about coughing up blood and we're talking about unexplained weight loss. Um, coughers and, or coughers, smokers in general, they're just gonna have a cough. They're gonna have some of that symptomology, but that doesn't mean cancer. So we're looking at these more serious things that could be indicative of cancer. And of course, if you are exhibiting that, you're not going to a screening program, you need a diagnostic. And so that's why it's really gonna separate you from this program. Okay, so a pack year, what that even means, it's how many packs a day you smoke times, yay math, how many years you have smoked, and then that's just a simple number. One quick multiplication problem, and that's your pack years. Um, and again, doesn't matter what kind of cigarette. Um, and there's a lot of people too that have um, you know, a history, they, they quit for six weeks here, they quit for a month here. You're really looking at the bigger picture. I mean, if somebody quit for five years, yes, you want to consider that. Um, but really just look at the bigger picture. Don't overcomplicate it. So, okay, very simple. Smoke a pack a day for 30 years, 30 pack years, that's it. If you smoke a pack and a half for 25, now we have 37.5. It's over the 30. So again, that person would qualify based on their smoking history. Um, and again, it is a grade B from the Preventive Task Force. So therefore, insurance does cover it as a um, screening service. 
Okay, so with any screening, you're gonna go ahead, you're gonna meet with your provider to go ahead and get that referral. Um, for this process specifically, it's going to be a licensed provider. Um, so MD, DO, um, a nurse practitioner, PA, and you're gonna complete what is called a shared decision-making visit. Um, and so basically, it's just a very tailored conversation about what is the screening. Um, what are the pros, what are the cons? Looking to make sure that you are in fact healthy enough to engage in this new screening routine. And um, also that if there are complications, if there's things down the road, that you can continue with um, follow-up treatment or scans or whatever it may be. So it's just having that very tailored discussion about is that right for you? Um, and then the referral to, and I kind of worded that specifically to go with what the doctors were saying, a specific radiology center that's capable of doing these scans and capable of doing them well. Um, it is a low dose CT. Not all places typically do the low dose CT. They're more accustomed to diagnostics, so there's some radiologists that um, you know prefer not to engage in this kind of a program. Uh, and there is a list. It's, it's just the registry, um, and those are hospitals and radiology centers that have said, yes, we're gonna follow a screening program, we're gonna read our CTs in this specific manner and follow these specific guidelines, um, and that is found through the American College of Radiology. So they have this list of sites throughout Colorado, um, and that's where you wanna go when looking for a place. And then just go to your visit, get screened, go back every year. Uh, so in Summit County, very conveniently, um, St. Anthony's is on that registry. They are capable of doing the scans. They also partner um, with St. Anthony's kind of in the Denver area, and they help out to read scans. So they do have that capacity, and they are able to get you through the program. What about folks without insurance? Are they eligible? To um, they, I mean, they'll absolutely qualify to get a scan. Uh, most places will you know, be out of pocket. I will say with the CT, it's not cheap, but it is going to be a little less than some other scans that you'll find. Um, on average, two to three hundred dollars. I believe that's the plan because mm -hmm. we're including St. Anthony's in the discussions. You know, they have a great right. charity care program. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there may be some, I might be able to get a We'll okay. see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I definitely want to leave space for anyone else to um, you know, give their, their part of this discussion here. So um, if there are any questions, please feel free to just follow up with me as well. Amy, do you have any idea what the, uh, the, the success rate is in terms of picking up uh, undiagnosed lesions? Um, so just how often is cancer found? Well, yeah, if you, if you look at that population, 55 to, to 78, um, 30 pack years, asymptomatic, put them through a low dose CT scan, what's the percentage of positives? Um, that is an excellent question. Um, so true, true positives, the cancer found typically one to 2% of the patient population. Okay. Um, but to highlight just the value of the screening and why it's important, it does reduce the mortality. We're finding cancers earlier at stage one or stage two um, as opposed to three or four because lung cancer is often asymptomatic until it's too late, essentially. So that's really the biggest draw. And I think what Fernando's question, which Amy actually has the stats, the one thing that I think that setting up the system of SAAs or someone who's on the registry who knows this, who uses the right, the one for two, two percent of people who are found to have that lung cancer, that's one subset. But Amy, then what is it, 30, 40 percent are often found to have other sort of things that come up, right, that have to be managed on some level, and so it's a rule out, like, what are those, are they related to another chronic disease, is it just a blip, what do you do, and so that medical management, which I think the knowledge will follow is a big part of what we try to make sure then, like, how do we manage the rest of everything that comes up, which is a big consideration. And I think one of the things that has been 
probably a negative. You know, some of the groups have basically been kind of naysaying around lung cancer screening because it picks up so many other things. But and what is, is it about? What percentage is it? About thirty percent? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I believe in working with National Jewish, what they typically see is maybe around 40% yeah. of incidentals. Yes. Um, and you know, keeping in mind, a chest CT, they're going to see everything, you know, they could see a liver lesion that needs to be followed up on or something like that. So um, around 40%, um, but not all of that needs to have a diagnostic or something like that. Just go back to your PCP and, and have it on the radar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do believe it's a 25% reduction in mortality from the low dose CT. So I'm going to kind of fly through some of this because after hearing all your presentations, I know you're really familiar with uh, tobacco prevention, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's happening here in Summit County. So um, why is public health involved in this work? So we received the STEP funding and we have for many years and it shifted so much like over the past 10 years, um, different between within our department, but different people may be heading up the um, the committees, and um, so you know I've been working in tobacco prevention through the step grant for the last year and a half, um, and I've been um, I've had the coalition the, with um, adults and youth, and we've really gotten into a lot of policy stuff over this past summer. So um, tobacco remains the number one cause of preventable death and disease in the U.S., over um, 500,000 uh, deaths a year. And um, the rates of smoking have really decreased, um, especially since the first Surgeon General's report came out to address smoking. Um, but unfortunately, we've seen a big rise in e-cigarette use since the early 2000s. Um, and then last year, e-cigarettes and vaping were declared an epidemic by the Surgeon General. Um, so this is just a little graphic showing um, the deaths in the U.S. each year um, from cigarette smoking. Um, so we do have access to the Summit County High School Healthy Kids Colorado um, <coughs> snapshot from 2015 and 2017. <coughs> And the rates there are pretty surprising. So um, we saw a big rise from 2015 to 2017 um, in vaping among youth at the high school. Um, we also saw an increase in cigarette use, and then we saw an increase um, in adult rate of smoking here in Summit County. And um, just anecdotally, have you seen a big rise like coming up in high school from those years do you think yes so um going to these town council meetings i always talk to them about like my personal story i've i'm born and raised here went to summit middle school summit high school and in summit middle school and health classes we were hit so hard with the anti-smoking campaigns and we were all so scared of cigarettes and it just seemed so astonishing that anyone would smoke cigarettes or do anything of the sorts. And so I remember by the time I was in seventh grade, um, e-cigarettes had kind of, they, the, an e-cigarette had been found on school property at the middle school. And so our school dean came up to us class to class and he was like, this is an e-cigarette, this is really dangerous. He gave us the whole spiel and we were like, that's like a cigarette. Like we were so scared. <laughs> And then just the following like five years or so, just I myself, like I and kids in grades above and below me, some as young as 12, middle school age now, are beyond familiarized with not just the type of e-cigarette he had, but especially jewels. So I've definitely seen an increase um, within my friend group, within my class, and within just the community in general. 
Um, and data shows for adults, you know, 70 adult smokers would like to quit. And we see multiple, you know, failed quit attempts in the data. And some of that's by trying to use the vaping products. Well, I'm really um, surprised at that from 5% to 16% of the high school. That's like yeah. two years. That's interesting. Yeah. We're really interested to see what's going to happen this fall. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is just a snapshot from 2017 showing the high school rates, a little bit of a different format, easier to see it that way. Um, so we know that youth vaping is second only to alcohol. Um, youth that vape are four to seven more likely um, than their peers to smoke cigarettes. And 95% um, of current smokers started before the age of 21. So this is all just demonstrating why the youth use of these products is so dangerous. Um, so we know that there's several community level strategies, um, including price, increasing the price of tobacco products, um, legal, increasing the age of sale of these products and implementing a tobacco retail license. Um, so the price increase, like you mentioned, um, youth are very price sensitive. So um, it, it definitely is evidence-based to show that it reduces initiation of use. Um, raising the legal age of sales. I know Bree talks about this all the time. I mean, you see, 18 year olds. Yeah, I just turned 18, but several months leading up to my 18th birthday, I had people, some that I knew, some that I really didn't, just come up to me, you're going to be 18, will you buy me stuff? And uh -huh. that's just the way people get their products. <laughs> you can still buy them online, that's the issue. Yeah, so in, I've kind of observed like two main ways of getting products. One, asking an 18 year old that they know, that they have a class with, that they play sports with, whatever. And the other one, honestly, at this point, is going into a store, despite being 16 or 17, mm -hmm. buying products without getting ID'd. Um, online purchasing is obviously a big question that we get um, a lot. And personally, I would say this isn't anything to say we shouldn't worry about it, but as of now, it's not that widespread because it's so like easy to access within the community and then also many online distributors such as Walmart have increased their age to 21 mm -hmm. regardless um, so that gets rid of that problem but um, so there are some online distributors that have increased their age to 21 and also honestly just the hassle of like submitting your ID and such first of all that gets rid of people below 18 which is honestly a big part of the audience that's using um but also like if it's not easily accessible and easy to just get a lot of people won't start at least and maybe won't continue any small deterrence we're very reactive to like anything that is hard <laughs> i'm just curious though so the, the rates in Santa county are markedly higher than the state average it goes back to a question that somebody asked earlier is is it because the density of shops for tourists who come to this area is higher? Is the density higher? It's hard to say. I mean, the retailer density based on the track data was high, but we know that that data is flawed because there's, because we don't have tobacco retail licensing, there was a lot of restaurants and um, other stores included in that list. So it's, it's, we're actually still working out the final list of retailers in Summit County to ca calculate the density really, but I mean, from what, what the youth say, I mean, they talk about how this is sort of like a party community and growing up with that all your life. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up around ski patrollers and raft guides, if that means anything to you guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a vacation area, and um, we know that, like, adult modeling of behaviors can be really influential yes. to youth, so... Um, and then, you know, the tobacco retail licensing gives us a clout for raising the age to 21. Um, so this just 
demonstrates a little bit of evidence of what increasing the price can do. So we know that increasing the price just a little bit uh, reduces um, smoking among adults and youth pretty drastically. Um, same with raising the minimum age of sales. So I think what we're really targeting is not the 17 and 18 year olds that are right on the line that will be able to buy in a couple years. We're targeting those real young kids that might have older siblings that can get the product. So 12, 13 year olds and you know from what we heard from the youth even younger. Um, so all of these strategies, I just want to reiterate, these are really evidence-based. They come from the 2014 guide, uh, Comprehensive Tobacco-Based Policies, and uh, it's about 200 pages, and it's kind of a, compiled from a lot of the Surgeon General's reports over the years. So they really make suggestions on the federal, state, and local level. So we know that these three strategies, it's definitely a three-pronged approach that's proven to be effective, especially on the local level. Um, this is just a quick quote from the tobacco industry conducting research on young people and how markets are gonna shift if price increases, God forbid. Um, so you might want to know, what do we have in Colorado already that prevents tobacco use? We have um, the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act, which prevents people from smoking inside and smoking in restaurants, and it was just updated this year to include vaping. Um, we have a tax of 84 cents per pack in Colorado, but I know that the tax in this last legislative session was it, they tried to raise it and it got voted down, so I don't know how many times that's happened over the years in like the past 14 years that we haven't had a tax increase, but it's a big problem because we're like 39th in the nation for tobacco tax, so we're right behind Kentucky, <laughs> which we know is um, the, kind of the tobacco state. Um, and then we have a House Bill 1033, which passed this year, and it allows um, counties and towns to enact stricter regulations on tobacco than the state. So we took that opportunity of House Bill 1033. We had some folks from Eagle County come over and um, talk about what they've done with increasing the age in tobacco retail licensing. Um, we had them present at a mayor and manager's meeting, and from then, um, Amy and I worked together, uh, convened a work group. We had um, representation from every town, and we all worked together to figure out how we can um, enact policies and strategies countywide. Okay, so each town in Summit County has officially passed an ordinance to increase the age of sale and implement tobacco retail licensing. So we've been around to every little town and then we went to um, the county just a couple weeks ago and they went right after the towns and passed it. Um, Congratulations. And, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and Bree's been to pretty much almost every meeting, I would say. <laughs> um, and, you know, we do have the November ballot question to increase the price, so every town has signed on to an IGA agreeing to this uh, ballot question. And... Um, so can I ask you a question? That's $4 additional? $4 per pack on top of, like, the 84 cents for the state. So that would bring a pack to a little over $9 in Summit County. Um, so that money will go back to each town and it will go back to the county for the unincorporated areas. And then in the IGA, it really outlined uh, pretty much five areas to, as recommendations to spend the money in. So education, prevention, cessation, enforcement, and access to health care. So I'll just say, we couldn't have done this without the YES group. I mean, hearing them talk at these meetings is really powerful for uh, the council members to really get the insight of someone in high school, someone growing up with a vaping ec epidemic. So um, if you'd like to just speak for a few minutes about what that process looks like for you. Yeah, yeah sure. So um, as Lauren said, we just went to the town council meetings and we really just 
wanted to share our story, wanted to tell them about our experiences. And it started off with myself and my two friends, Courtney and Logan. And um, I talked about the progression of how it started as, oh, e-cigarettes are scary, they're like smoking cigarettes, to everyone's vaping all the time, kind of the vaping epidemic. And Logan talks about youth brain development. She presents to the county or to the council members about how our youth brains, our prefrontal cortexes aren't fully developed while our amygdals are, which makes us susceptible to impulse decision making. You guys get it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then Courtney talked a little bit about her personal experiences, about how it's not just seen at school, it's not just seen at social events, but how it has very much digressed and become prevalent into the home lives of younger people. And she tells a story about her younger brother, who's 11, I think he's 12 now, and how one day after school he comes home and he starts talking about vaping and how his friend has a jewel and he draws a jewel on a piece of paper for Courtney to see. And so it's stories like these that the council members, um, they really opened their eyes and you know, what started with us three, um, eventually more youth became involved. Um, there are so many people in this community that have similar stories and there were certain meetings, that you can look at the bottom left picture, but there was a Brecktown Council meeting where we filled an entire row and a half of YES members and high school students that either spoke or were behind every single word that was said. And so... Um, and it was all during the summer. Like, yeah. Wow. Like, for, yeah. So, yeah. so obviously this is um, an issue that's not just a big deal for me or for Courtney and Logan, but for all of the youth in the community, and it was really amazing to see just more and more people get involved. I have a friend who stood in front of the town council members and talked about how she was addicted to vaping and how her mom found all of her stuff and was forced to quit by being drug tested. And she tells this crazy story and goes, thank God my mom is so nosy. And <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it is delivered in a very funny way, but it's also fundamentally so sad just because it has, that's a common issue that so many people are facing. Um, so with that, I kind of wanted to address a few things that have come up in conversation today. Um, everything that you guys say about youth perception and about what the youth have reported to you, I completely agree with, <laughs> if that means anything. <laughs> and I um, echo it, and I see it in Summit County as well. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about youth reaction to media coverage of the deaths, um, because there are very mixed responses. Um, before all of the deaths were getting such crazy media attention, and before this became an issue, I would stand in front of town councils and I would say, the Healthy Kids Survey is going to be reissued in 2019 and I think the rates are going to go up significantly again. Now I still believe that they're not decreasing, that's for sure. Um, they might stay the same, they might slightly increase, however, this media coverage of the deaths have influenced our perceived threat of the product. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted to talk a little bit about the counter culture on social media to that. So while people are posting, guys, don't vape, or like, I'm throwing away my vape, or like, I don't want to die, there's also people posting things such as, oh, these deaths you hear in the news, those are for people that buy like faulty cartridges and such. And so there's definitely a counter, and there's also that argument of like, oh, the government doesn't need to protect us from ourselves. Um, and that too has become very prevalent. And I just want to say that media coverage of deaths is not enough to cause someone to quit. It is not enough to drive someone, especially a teenager, away from their nicotine addiction. And the cessation support that is offered and that is growing is super excellent. 
but speaking for the youth based off of my experiences, it doesn't feel accessible to us in any way. Um, the quit line just doesn't seem like something a youth would do. It's not advertised it to us. Not many people know about it. Chantax, Chantix? I don't even feel like that's <laughs> obviously not offered to youth. Um, the care clinic, it's an amazing resource. A lot of people go there for care. <laughs> and a lot of people have gone there for mental health concerns, for, you know, whatever. And it's an amazing resource. However, I have friends that feel the only way that they can quit vaping is by giving me their product mm -hmm. and giving their friends their product and saying, I can't do this by myself. And they don't feel like they have the support system they need. Their family isn't there. It's still, there's a lot of stigma behind youth use of nicotine products. And I feel like we feel like society isn't ready to accept the fact that, yeah, 40% of our Summit High School student body has a nicotine addiction. The society that we live in, we feel, isn't ready to accept that and therefore isn't ready to help us. And so with that, I really feel like we need to target the youth on the cessation efforts that are available to us and maybe make some that are targeted at youth and that are specific to our needs because addiction in youth is obviously very different than addiction in, adult, in adults. We haven't been smoking for 30 years. We haven't been smoking for 15 years. We've been vaping every day, a pod a day, for maybe a year. And it varies, obviously. Um, but yeah, everything that the youth have said, all of the things that you said, um, are like all the things that we are drawn to about the products, the flavors, the accessibility, those are all, all very valid. Can I ask you a question about the whole idea of like someone saying, hey, when you take my products, I need somebody like an accountability buddy or somebody to keep me. So in your, I mean, you're obviously very, pre uh, very present. I mean, people know what you stand for. Mm -hmm. at, at school, I mean, knowing this, do you get pushback as sort of being, the goody goody, or is it like, hey, that's someone who can really support me? Or the big or, police. Yeah, like um, how how is that? I think that idea of like peer support is super interesting. Mm -hmm. But if you're a very vocal person about it, is there a lash, you know, sort of a yeah. backlash towards you? How is that? Um, there's always both sides. Um, I would say, well, first of all, like a big thing that yes is talking about moving into now is we would like to use some of the funds raised by this tax increase to create a peer-to-peer -peer cessation uh -huh. effort yeah. and so already in the county we have like peer counseling which is peer-to-peer -peer mental health support in which the kids in the class learn mental health first aid and they learn mm -hmm. signs of suicide and they learn how to talk to someone who's struggling we would like to recreate something similar to that um, where it's peer-to-peer -peer support. But to answer your question, um, I would say that not a lot of the student body kind of knows what we've been up to, especially the underclassmen, because we don't have very many underclassmen in YES right now. Um, but it's definitely spreading as this is becoming more and more of like a real thing that's happening as the ordinance has passed and like it's gonna be active like in November and stuff. Um, I have had like uh, like my sister's boyfriend vapes and like uses all these nicotine products and stuff and like he's like what? like uh, obviously I've had people like call me out and like they don't understand my intentions they don't care they just like they're angry whatever <laughs> um, but I've also had people like freshmen they when when you're like when you tell someone oh I'm turning 18 the first thing that pops in their mind is you can buy jewel pots and that's like kind of a joke but it's a real thing that pops into the youth's mind. And so I've had like freshmen like come up and say that and I'm like, oh, actually not mm -hmm. anymore. Like it's gonna increase to 21 and they're so shocked, but they don't, they didn't know that this was happening yet. So mm -hmm. I would like to be that image of someone who's willing to like help someone quit. But honestly, I don't have the resources. I don't know how to aid someone in quitting their nicotine addiction, so. Um, how well aware do you think the youth are about how like one jewel pot is equal to what is it a hundred cigarettes? One um, pack. 
Well, or no, a hundred. One pack, sorry. I was thinking Puka. That's part of the thing is you hear different stats all the time. I would say that it, it's kind of mixed. It kind of depends on the age and like how long they've been vaping and stuff. My personal experience is junior year, I had a lot of friends that vaped and they well understood the you know the health effects of it and the harm it was doing to them they knew how bad it was but they didn't care and so that's kind of why I was driven into this because I took the peer counseling class and came from like a mental health mindset mm -hmm. and I was like people with mental health issues people that are depressed people that have self-image issues those are the people vaping however there's obviously like a whole new demographic not just of people that have mental health issues but also people that are like don't know so like I have both I have friends that both are well aware and friends that especially when they started was like oh what's this um so I don't know thank you Maso Menos <laughs> I just want to tell, I just want to tell, I just want to congratulate you on the way you do you really, really impressive thank you and I hope that you choose a career in medicine or health I was going to say public health I was going to say public health thank you <laughs> Thank you. I was going to ask when you're running for city council. Mm -hmm. I know. I've already said I was going to vote for her. For her. <laughs> so these three girls will be speaking at the high school next week on the 29th as part of like a parent engagement, and it will probably be. A, I'm not sure what you guys are planning, but it will probably include a lot more about like what is vaping and then the policy work and stuff because like there's still education. so many that have no idea that's why i was taking notes on all your presentations <laughs> <laughs> write down the chemical names and stuff it's for that presentation yeah sam could probably send it to you yeah, yeah. every year uh, every year in summit county the summit foundation which is a major funder of most nonprofits, has an award day <laughs> called the Philanthropy Award Day. And it recognizes the outstanding citizen and the outstanding educator and the outstanding philanthropist. This year, the outstanding collaborative, community collaborative project goes to YES.